Hello everyone and welcome to another Wolf Electronic ISOS webinar. My name is Markus Eberle and I will moderate this webinar today. We are very pleased that you took the time to participate in our webinar. The topic of today's uh, webinar is common mode jokes parameters explained. Our speaker today is Steffen Schulze, who is working as field application engineer at Wolf Electronic ISOS. He will hold today's webinar and also answer your questions. Now, before we start the webinar, I would like to point out one thing. You will be muted during this webinar. That means that you cannot ask us questions via the microphone, but nevertheless, you have the opportunity to ask us questions with the chat function. And yeah, we have scheduled around 30 minutes for the presentation. And after that, we have scheduled also some time, 10 to 15 minutes for a Q&A session. So we will answer your questions after the presentation. If you have any under, other questions left after the webinar, you can also just email us at webinarteam at we-online.com. After the webinar, you will be asked to participate in a feedback survey. Of course, we would be pleased if you take the time to fill out the survey and help us to improve our webinars. You will also receive the link to the presentation as well as to the recording of today's webinar only in the next few days via email. So and now I want to hand over to our speaker and I wish you an exciting webinar. Thank you, Marcus, for introduction and also welcome from my side. So let's start with the presentation. You should see now. Yeah. So today's topic, see. as already mentioned, is uh, parameters explained, parameters of common joke especially. So what will be the today's agenda? First, I would like to yeah, introduce the topic by speaking about some core materials especially ferrite materials, which are usually used for common mode choke products. Then we, look, we will have a look at um, core shapes, which are existing in principle, and what are the differences between them. And the last part and the main part of this presentation will be about the main parameters, how they are measured, how they are determined, yeah, and what are the relations between them. So first, let's look at the, some core materials, and I would like to start with uh, by, by repeating what is hysteresis. So maybe you know from your physics study or from school that uh, each magnetic material or ferromagnetic material, um, yeah, has a hysteresis. So if I change, if I bring it into a magnetic field and I change the amplitude of the magnetic field, then the flux on the flux density inside the material changes in a nonlinear way. And here in this diagram, I have compared three different hysteresis cycles uh, of three different materials. The first two in green and red are the nickel zinc and manganese zinc uh, standard ferrite materials. And these, are, these mixtures are usually and widely used for suppression elements, also for power products, power inductors and transformers. But here, especially, we speak about materials which generate losses and which are used for noise suppression. And the third one, which you see in, in yellow color or orange color, is this a nanocrystalline material, which is not belonging to the class of ferrites, which is a specific material which has a usually very high permeability. This can already be seen when we look at the central part of this diagram where there are the transition from the yeah, negative uh, field level to the positive field level is quite steep. And uh, yeah, this transition or the slope of the, of the transition indicates uh, and is proportional to the permeability of the material. So when it's very steep, the permeability is high. What advantage we have, if we have a core with high permeability, its advantage is that we don't need so many winding turns in order to achieve a certain inductance. So winding turns can be reduced <clears throat> and uh, wire diameter can be increased, for example, and we get a higher rate of current in the end. So what are the 
typical um, yeah, value ranges for different uh, ferrite materials and the nanocrystalline material, which we use in our products. So the nickel zinc ferrite, which is consisting of uh, yeah, nickel oxide, zinc oxide, and iron oxide, mainly in a different mixture. So we can reach uh, initial permeability values or relative permeability values up to 800. If you need higher or want to have higher permeability values, then we have to use manganese zinc mixtures where it goes up to 10,000 as a factor. And the highest values we can reach with nanocrystalline material. Here we have a maximum 95,000, but in general, you can get materials up to 200,000, 200,000 as a factor, but those are for specific applications. And then there are components existing which combine different core materials. In this case, you see the EXP series from us, which has uh, two cores. One is made of nickel zinc and it has a permeability of 400 combined with a manganese zinc core, both in toroidal shape, and it has a permeability of 6,000. So with this combination, we can achieve a higher or wider uh, broadband frequency noise suppression. So in principle, um, we can say that nanocrystalline material, which has a highest permeability, but it's for the lowest frequency ranges up to several hundred kilohertz. Then the next higher frequency range will be uh, covered by manganese zinc cores. So roughly up to 20 megahertz. And everything above 20 megahertz is then covered by nickel zinc cores. So this can go up to several hundred megahertz depending on the yeah, permeability and of the construction of the core. So let's look at some core shapes which we find in general on the market. So first for mains voltage or yeah, mains voltage chokes. So this is very common um, shape here in the vertical oriented toroid with uh, in a, for one phase choke with two windings on it and the separator to, uh, yeah, to increase the creepage and clearance distances between the windings, usually mounted on a base plate and as a THD product. This is the open construction. If I put it into a plastic housing for insulation purposes, then we find this shape, for example. And then it's possible to, yeah, to orient the core in a horizontal manner, just to save uh, yeah, height in your application, but you need a larger footprint, more size on your PCB. The so horizontal core has an advantage of having a lower parasitic capacitance between the input and output terminals compared to the vertical oriented core. Here's a smaller core also already inside a plastic housing. In the center, we see the so-called frame cores, either without a center leg, like shown here, and a rectangular cross section where the windings are separated on two different legs, on two opposite legs of the core. Or sometimes we have the frame core with, an, with a center leg, but without any air gap inside, and the windings are are placed on the, on the center leg side by side. The same as we can find here on the vertically oriented core, frame core, um, at this uh, part specifically, or in a larger size, uh, like seen here on the right side. Again, a frame core with the center leg and the two windings in parallel on the center leg. For low power applications or for data line, um, noise suppression, we usually find uh, smaller combo chokes, again with a toroidal core inside, so here on the left side, which is usually horizontally oriented and uh, molded inside a plastic housing. Then here have the vertically oriented drum core, mostly shielded one, so there's a ferrite shield on the, on the circumference. Then the so-called H core with a plate, on top is this ferrite plate, which is glued onto the core. And this can be automatically wound very easily. If you use a block core and uh, 
yeah, with a slit inside and we can feed through, for example, flat wire uh, winding on, on into this core and it's a, it's a very robust construction and uh, compact. But with this uh, choke, you cannot achieve a high inductance because we usually have only one, one winding, one uh, loop of the wire through the core. And on the right side, we see a um, ceramic substrate with integrated conductive material, but this is intended to be used for yeah, higher frequency um, noise suppression. So in the gigahertz range, for example. So let's come to the parameters. Here we see an overview about uh, the main parameters, which I will speak about subsequently. First one, of course, is the main inductance of this component. And in the data sheet, you find a table where the main inductance is indicated by the symbol L. And it's also written how much inductance we have. So in this case, in this example, uh, each winding has 2.5 millihenries with a tolerance of plus minus 30%. And this factor of two, which is written here, indicates that there are two windings with equal inductance of 2.5 millihenries. So inductance is measured at a certain frequency range or frequency, fixed frequency, and with a certain current amplitude, in this case, 100 microamps. How we determine this inductance? Just by using an LCR meter, which is attached to each uh, winding separately. And the other windings, or in this case, if a one phase choke, the other winding is left open. If I would make a loop here or connect both ends of this winding additionally, then I would have a transformer principle and I would also measure the mutual inductance, which I don't want to. So it's left open. And of course, the inductance of both windings should be quite. Yeah, similar or equal to each other with inside the tolerance band. Here you see an, a view, a picture of uh, how it could look like the measurement. This LCR meter in the background and the two terminals connected to the wire, to one winding. Next and related to the main inductance is the so-called leakage inductance or stray inductance. For this specific example, which I've chosen here, there's no information given in the data sheet, but I will show you later how it's possible to calculate the uh, leakage inductance from the differential mode impedance curve. In principle, it's possible to measure the leakage inductance by short circuiting uh, one end or one, one side of the common mode choke, like shown here on the right side and connect the LCR meter on the open, on the left open uh, terminals. In this case, the main inductance is uh, compensated and uh, due to the opposing, opposing uh, currents flowing inside the windings and only the stray field is uh, acting. So for perfect coupling, the coupling factor would be near to one. Of course, it would be, yeah, perfect coupling would be 100% and a K factor would be one, but in reality, we find values from yeah, 95% up to 99% or 99.5, but 100% it's not possible to reach. So the higher the coupling factor, the lower the strain inductance. Also shown here, how it's measured, and you see on the right side here's a, a connection to the terminals of, of, the, of one side of the windings and here in the background, this is a short circuit connection of the output side of the choke. Related to the leakage inductance is uh, the winding structure. So in principle, there are different uh, types of winding structures possible. On the left side, we see the so-called sectional winding where we have a separation of the windings on the core. So it's a yeah, geometric or spatial uh, separation and mostly also yeah, added 
with a separator between the windings just to increase the cleavage and cleavance distances. The sectional winding has the advantage of having not having a higher weighted voltage because yeah, the windings simply are the wires are simply uh, further apart from each other. So insulation does not is not that critical. And uh, we can reach higher weighted voltages. But on the opposite side, uh, the strain inductance is higher because the coupling of the windings, the further the part, the part they are, uh, the lower the coupling, the smaller the coupling, and the higher the strain inductance. So it can go up to yeah, five percent in maximum. On the other side, we speak about the so-called multifiler winding, or in the case of two wires, it's named bifiler winding where each of the wires um, are tight, uh, is, is tightly um, wound around the core. So then the compensation effect can take place in the vicinity of the wire. And um, yeah, if I have the same number of turns, the same core, like on the side here, then also the main inductance would be the same. But the strain inductance or leakage inductance is much, much smaller because coupling here is much stronger. This can be also um, yeah, visually seen on this page, which, uh, which is a simulation. So we see here a cross section of a toroidal core on the left side with the sectional winding. And the green color here indicates the field amplitude, the magnetic field amplitude, which is yeah, distributed quite equally here inside the core and so extends uh, further away from the wires. Whereas for the bifolar winding, we see that the magnetic field yeah, is only in the vicinity of the wires and uh, rapidly drops if I go away from the, from the two wires, just already in the center of the core, it's very, very small. So for some, uh, match codes for some parts I have measured and additionally calculated the stray inductance. So this is uh, summarized in this table here on this slide. So the first one is a data line choke or low power, low voltage combo choke and the other four are mains chokes with a sectional winding. And there we find ranges uh, roughly 1% or half a percent up to 1.5% for the FC series. The SR2, which has a bifolar winding, it has a much smaller uh, leakage inductance of only 0.1%. This equation which you see here on the top is how to calculate the strain inductance from the differential mode impedance curve. Yeah, and the frequency, and I will show you an example later. The next parameter I would like to explain in more detail is uh, DC resistance of the separate windings. So it's quite easy to measure. We simply take a milliohm meter and measure the resistance. So we are usually in the milliohm range. And again, in the data sheet, there's a factor of two uh, indicated here, which simply uh, yeah, says that there are, on, there are two windings with equal um, maximum DC resistance. So the, the tolerance bound is always given, given the upper bound, so the maximum RDC. And the test condition uh, gives you information about at which temperature, at which ambient temperature it was measured. So here's a test setup uh, in uh, displayed, right side so the milliometer here in the background which, uh, yeah, so which you can perform a four wire measurement, which is very precise. And related to the DC resistance, of course, is a rated current. So rated current of such a product um, is um, always given for a certain self heating of the component, which in our case for this example is 55 Kelvin. 
the rated current has a symbol IR, index R. And how to read this line of the data sheet? Um, if I apply a DC current of 10.3 amps, then the self-heating of the component is maximum 55 Kelvin above the ambient temperature. So again here, the upper bound, the upper tolerance limit is This is how we measure the rated current. It's like a similar setup like uh, measuring the leakage inductance. We simply uh, connect the two windings and uh, put them in series. And then we attach the uh, DC generator terminals to the, to the open side of the, of the choke, put everything into a wooden box, which in the end will be closed. And yeah, also the component uh, is then observed by the infrared camera, which looks through the ceiling of this box. And, and the current is uh, slightly increased step by step. Waiting, we are waiting for a thermal equilibrium. And yeah, so in the end, we get an, a current uh, or a temperature versus current curve. And if we reach a certain self heating, then at this point, the rated current is uh, red from the diagram. This is a closer look at an example. There's a small LF series SMT component where the two connections are visible for the generator. And of course, as you can imagine, first uh, the winding heats up. And due to the thermal coupling, a bit later, with some delay, the core also heats up. And related to the rated current is the so-called derating. That means um, if I increase or if I, if I put my component into an ambient temperature, which is above a certain limit ambient temperature, then I have to decrease the current flowing through the winding. So for mains filter chokes, mains line chokes, um, the limit is normally the 70 degrees Celsius because we have a maximum operating temperature of our components of 125 degrees Celsius. And for 55 Kelvin, then it's just a difference. Uh, so the rated current is defined for 55 Kelvin self-heating. And so I have to reduce if I go above the 70 degrees. The reduction is not done linearly. Instead, it's a nonlinear behavior, which you will see on the next slide. So there's slightly a, a margin or a buffer, which you have for, for the rated current. So this is valid for mains filter chokes. As I said, for some other match codes or some other products, the Rated current is defined differently. So we find not only 55 Kelvin self heating, but also 20 or 40 or 45, depending on the series. So you always have to look at the definition for the rated current and what value was used. So this is how it looks graphically up to the limit temperature, ambient temperature, which is uh, here on the x axis. Um, we can apply 100% of the rated current, and then the current has to be reduced by this uh, you know, square root uh, manner. But it's a maximum operating temperature, which is reached here, for example, 125 degrees Celsius. The current has to be reduced theoretically to zero. It means no more current allowed. Of course, there are some, uh, some uh, margin and you can still apply um, yeah, a small amount of current at this temperature, but we don't guarantee that the component will behave as, it, as intended at this temperature. You have to check it by yourself. The next parameter I would like to speak about is the rated voltage. The rated voltage is depending on the operating voltage of your system where you want to attach this uh, or to use this common mode choke. Of course, the higher the working voltage, 
of your system, the higher the rated voltage of the component should be. It should fit to each other. So in this special specific case of my example here, it's an HV, it's a high voltage choke, and it has a six, 760 volts RMS um, rated voltage, which is uh, yeah measured at 50 hertz. So it's a normal sinusoidal mains voltage. And um, yeah, so construction of the component, component has to be according to the standard, for example, the IEC 6938-2, which defines the minimum clearance and cubic distances for such components, for such inductive components. And yeah, our products are designed according to these international standards. Then we, before uh, releasing a product, we have to make a so-called stress test for the rated voltage. That means we put several components, equal, equal components uh, side by side or actually in parallel on a PCB. And then before we apply the rated voltage for one hour, we have to measure the main parameters like an inductance, DC resistance and insulation voltage. And after one hour of continuous application of the rated voltage, uh, we measure the parameters again and there must be no deviation between them. So no alteration is allowed. And during the test, also the current is monitored to see if there are some yeah, sparks or some uh, current leakage um, in the windings, which could be an indicator of uh, yeah, having a fault inside a component. And the last main parameter I would like to uh, mention is the uh, insulation test voltage, which of course is related to the rated voltage. So also there's a, a factor between them given in the standards. So for this component, for example, it's three kilovolts RMS. That's an AC voltage applied uh, with a frequency of 50 Hertz. And over a period of two seconds, the monitor is, as the current is monitored, and it should not increase or go above five milliamps in this case. So according to different international standards, there are different definitions which we can find in, in those standards. For example, the already mentioned five milliamps amps for two second application of the voltage or three milliamps for a longer period, for example, five seconds. Yes, and uh, this maximum current must not be exceeded. Here you see the test setup on possible arrangement. On the left side, the high voltage generator with the two terminals here. And these terminals, the probe has some probe tips in the end of the wires. And uh, this is then applied to the component for this certain period of time. And the uh, last parameters I want to mention are the so-called derived parameters. But first, uh, the first one, the scattering parameters, which you normally don't find explicitly in the data sheet, only by yeah, choosing or selecting the separate files from the, uh, from, from the homepage, for example, from the online catalog. You can download uh, scattering parameter files for some series. So, Meanwhile, we measure all our series um, on a special PCB with a vector network analyzer. So for the simplest component combo choke with only two windings, you need a minimum four port network analyzer. And each port has its uh, characteristic impedance of 50 ohms. And the modern network analyzers are capable of uh, you know, applying and measuring also the so-called mixed mode parameters. That means not the single ended ones, which are related to 50 ohms, but also the common mode and differential mode excitation and, and, and uh, yeah, reception of the signal. So with those capabilities, you it's quite easy to derive the mixed mode scattering parameters, which are then arranged in this manner, like indicated here. So we have the reflected waves on the left side and the 
incident waves on the right side, and between them, the so-called scattering parameter matrix. In this case, it has 16 entries. So four of them are for the differential mode excitation and reception, four for the common mode exception, uh, reception and excitation, and eight of them, which are indicating the so-called uh, mode conversion between differential and common mode. So if those components are non-zero, then it's an indication of the symmetry that, that there's no perfect symmetry of the component. So because we have here the, the most information we can get from those components, that means amplitude and phase, those scattering parameters are universal. Just to show an example how such a test board could look like for small uh, data line chokes, CNSA series. This component is soldered here in the center of the board. And here we see the 50 ohm trimmed uh, microstrip lines with the crucial connectors on, on both ends, on, on all ends. Yeah. And so the board is normally then before. Uh, finalizing the measurement is uh, de-embedded or yeah, has made a um, calibration before uh, the final measurement. So we can we have only the scattering parameters of the component itself. And if I have the measured the scattering parameters, I can derive several other parameters like the attenuation, for example. So again, differentiated, distinguished between common mode and differential mode attenuation. So common mode attenuation, we simply need the yeah, SCC to one parameter, that means the transfer parameter from one side to the other. And in the logarithmic scaling in decibel, decibels, uh, we can then have a frequency dependent attenuation curve, which we put into the data sheet. And the same, of course, can be applied to the differential mode excitation. Then you have to uh, take care of the so-called reference impedance. So for a single ended measurement, it would be 50 ohms. But for common mode excitation, it's two times 50 ohms in parallel. That means 25 ohms. And for differential mode excitation, it would be two times 50 ohms in series. That means 100 ohms. Then here is an example again for this product which I have used before already. Uh, how these curve looks, curves look like? So in blue, indicated is a common mode attenuation um, in the 25 ohm system in decibel scaling. So we have a, see here the typical first resonance uh, between 400 and 500 kilohertz. Then the impedance or attenuation drops due to the capacitive effect, because of the capacitance of the product. And for higher frequencies, we find those yeah, multiple resonances at equidistant uh, yeah, frequency intervals. And the orange line indicates the differential mode impedance, in this case, not impedance, attenuation, because due to the much smaller leakage inductance, it's also much smaller um, attenuation in, for differential mode, and it starts only above one megahertz in this case. So for lower values, it's only the only the resistance of the wire is uh, active, and yeah, then skin effect and uh, the leakage inductance take over, and uh, yeah, let the attenuation increase. And the last parameter I would like to uh, mention is the impedance already spoke about this, but um, here, if we have the scattering parameters measured for a component, we can simply calculate the differential mode or common mode impedance via the so-called chain parameters, the chain parameter matrix, and the differential mode impedance, for example, is one of those four parameters, which can be calculated by using each of the scattering parameters for differential mode excitation. Of course, this is complex, yeah, and in the end, I have information about magnitude and phase, and usually we then take 
only the magnitude of the impedance and displayed on a data sheet. This is then how it looks like. Of course, the curves are similar to the attenuation curves, especially regarding the resonance points, which are at the same yeah, frequencies. But of course, the scaling is different. Here we have a logarithmic scaling of the impedance. And we see already the much smaller differential mode impedance compared to the main or common mode impedance due to the yeah, leakage effect. So last, I would like to uh, compare two different chokes or two different uh, uh, winding styles of one product, which has uh, 51 microhenries uh, of inductance, both of them on the left side. The one has a bifurcated winding and the right side is a sectional winding. So both have equal number of turns and therefore the same main inductance. But if I look at the impedance graphs, then we see the difference. Not for the common mode impedance, the curves here lie on top of each other, but for the differential mode or sectional case, the differential mode impedance is much higher compared to the bifurcated wind, winding choke. And if I select, for example, at one megahertz uh, and look at the values of each uh, graph at this frequency, then I can read the, graph, uh, the value from the graph and put it to the equation which I've showed you before. So the inductance can be calculated by you know, dividing the impedance by two pi times the frequency where I, where I have read the data from the graph. So in this case, one megahertz. And for this specific case, if I do the calculations, then I can get I get 48, roughly 48 microhenries for the main inductance, which of course is inside the tolerance band for 51 microhenry nominal. And for the two differential mode impedance curves, yeah, one first the sectional one. That's 20 ohms. And this gives me this gives me a value of roughly three microhenries. And if I use a bifurcated bifurcated wound uh, choke, then it's only 0.65 ohms at the same frequency, and this is already much smaller value due to the bifurcated winding. So we are in the nanohenry range now. Yeah, that's everything I would like to yeah, explain to you. And now I'm curious about your questions. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, Stefan, from my side for your interesting presentation. Yeah, as you've mentioned it, now we would like to turn our attention to your questions. And so we wait a little until some questions come in. I already see also some questions and yeah. So then let's just have a look and yeah, Stefan, then first question I see here, does a saturation effect need to be considered for common mode jokes? Yes, yes, it would be. Um, there are some aspects we need to consider. Thank you. Yeah, the core saturation topic was not included in my main presentation because due, due to the time, but of course uh, I can show you here that there is an effect. So a specific, specific important for small cores with small cross section and high, I would say high common mode current amplitudes, which are usually found in, for example, inverter driven motor applications uh, with very long uh, wires or leads, which um, yeah lie in a in a metal or near to a metal uh, housing or metal uh, frame where we have where we can have quite high coupling capacitances. So, just an example shown here on this slide: if I have a coupling capacitance of one wire to Earth of only 100 picofarads and the switching slope for example, of an IGBT of 10 kilowatts per microsecond. So it already gives me a, a maximum amplitude of a common mode current of one amp. And one amp for a small 
sized uh, toroid core, for example, is already quite a lot, quite a lot. So I have measured here, as you can see, different curves of uh, some main line chokes. I have measured uh, the effect of the common mode inductance reduction. So starting at one at zero amps and uh, going up to maximum one amp. And because those cores have no air gap, which I told you already, then the saturation effect is uh, immediately uh, taking place and the inductance continuously decreases. So this is, looks not, not that dramatic, but if you look that here the inductance scaling is logarithmic, rhythmic, and uh, so the effect is quite large, and especially for the cores which have a high permeability, like the red one has a nanocrystalline series, as one milli Henry's, yeah, then a, there's a dramatic reduction already for the inductance. And of course, inductance, if the inductance is lower, then uh, so also the attenuation effect is decreased and they don't have the expected yeah, attenuation anymore. But it's only the critical for, yeah, for very high compound currents or if there is an unbalance in a, for example, in a three phase a power supply system, if there's an unbalance between the three phases and this three phase combo choke has no fourth winding to include the neutral line, then there could be a partial saturation between two of the phases, for example. And uh, this can lead to a reduction effect of the performance. Okay. So thank you very much, Stefan, for the answer. So then let's go away. I see there are a lot of questions coming in at the moment. Um, so just a hint, if we can't answer your question now in the live webinar, we will answer it later on via email. So then let's just go on. Um, Stefan, why is the S-parameter PCB fixture uses microstrip transmission lines rather than a complete return ground plane? Actually, this uh, the board which I have showed here. It has a continuous ground plane here. This is the bottom side, which is uh, just um, yeah covered with uh, green lacquer. And uh, you see the wires here yeah, around on, on the edge of each uh, microstep line. This is uh, the top side here, and we are wires. We go to the ground. So the ground that means it is it's put to the top side the ground potential so that then we can finally and precisely adjust the 50 ohm um, characteristic, characteristic impedance of the microstrip. Of course, for THD components, that would be different. For THD components, you have normally a ground plane on the bottom side, where are the, yeah, which acts as a, as a reference for the microstrip. Okay. So thank you very much. Then let's go ahead. Um, Stefan, what is RF choke and how it differs from other types? Yeah, I think this is uh, regarding the uh, slide which I've showed here in the beginning. So the ceramic type, actually it's, uh, yeah, it's not different in, in the behavior of the, of the choke. Um, it's only intended to be used for high frequencies. That means uh, the inductance is normally very small, so it's in the nano Henry range for very small components. But um, the insertion loss for the intended signal is, is also quite low. So that's why, that's why those components are used usually for high speed data signals, where the yeah, distortion of the signal is critical and should not be too much. Otherwise, it will not be detected. But in principle, this, it's a similar um, yeah, behavior. So we have a mutual coupling between the conductive structures, between the conductive um, layers inside the ceramic substrate. And although it's not a ferrite material, um, yeah, where it's embedded, it still has an 
effect of uh, mutual coupling between the windings and has a common mode effect, but for higher frequencies. Okay, thank you very much for your explanation. So then let's go on with the next one. So um, can you take advantage of differential mode EMI filtering using the common mode jokes? Yes, that's of course possible. So in order to avoid a separate differential mode filter using a single core choke, for example, single core inductor, you could use uh, simply a frame core, for example, core mode choke, mm -hmm. which by its nature has a higher leakage inductance and this leakage inductance could be enough to suppress also differential mode noise, maybe in combination with an X capacitor. So if you consider the mains filter, design, then usually we have X capacitors in combination with the leakage inductance. This uh, yeah, offers you the pos possibility of having a AC low pass filter for differential mode. Okay, so now we nearly have to come to an end uh, regarding the time, but one last question we can answer. Um, Stefan, are larger inductance values normally available in sectional windings versus B filar windings? I'm not sure. I'm, I would say no, mm -hmm. because uh, if you consider the same shape, the same geometry of the of a toroidal core, for example, in principle, for sectional winding, we need a separation of the windings. That means the number of turns usually is less than compared to a bifilar winding, where we can use this, the full circumference of the core for the windings. So due to the separation needed, usually the number of turns is smaller and the inductance value is then is also smaller. Okay. So to reach the same inductance, you, need, you simply need a larger core. Okay, thank you very much. So I think, uh, yeah, um, as it was a quick answer, one more last question. Um, are common mode choke models available for circuit simulators like LT Spice or yeah, Spice? Yes, you simply go to our website on the online catalog for each series. You find, uh, for, yeah, for most of the series, you find uh, models for LT Spice and P Spice for download. Also, additionally, uh, for the S parameters, which I mentioned. So just download those models, uh, insert them into the LT Spice uh, library structure, and then you can use them just from the beginning and uh, yeah, without any modifications. Those models are based uh, on the S parameter measurements and are quite precise up to several hundred megahertz. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much. Yeah, now we are finished with our webinar already. already. If there are any questions left now from your side, we will answer them via email after the webinar. And if you still have any other questions left, just email us at isis minus, oh, sorry, webinar team at we minus online.com. You see the, um, yeah, the email address at the moment. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the webinar and also many thanks again, Stefan, for, for your time today. Yes, also thank so again from my side and thank you for organizing, Markus. No problem, you're welcome. So I wish you a good day and yeah, have a nice week. Hopefully we will hear us at the next time again. So yeah, bye. Goodbye.